Dames en heren, Alexander de Hoge. Alexander, I already introduced you. Just take us along. 35 minutes, a public lecture. Inspire us. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon. First of all, congratulations, Ewout, for the prize. Thank you, Bas, uh, for the invitation to speak here. I must say I consider it a great privilege uh, to speak at this event uh, to this beautiful audience that you are uh, in this amazing city. So I don't take this for granted. So I will do my best to keep you entertained for 44 minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> I'm a partner in a design organization. What I mean by this is that we bring an, a design attitude. I'm based as an architect, urbanist, uh, civil engineer. But we bring a design attitude to problems of space, uh, and also problems related to space, but not strictly spatial processes, collaborations, etc., etc. I used to be a full-time uh, chair at, uh, at MIT, uh, so I've lived in Boston for a very long time. And uh, recently, I decided to, to scope back uh, the amount of academic activities to really uh, uh, choose uh, this as the dominant uh, career path with a fantastic group of people that are based in New York, and in Brussels, so that's where we are based. Um, in case you didn't know where these cities are. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a bunch of places worldwide that we are uh, currently working. Uh, one of the reasons I really wanted to, uh, to, to, let's say, get my hands dirty and stand with your feet in the mud in the real world is uh, that we have fantastic and great and very uh, problematic challenges that we are facing. If you look at the left side of the slide, you see you know, this was from the Davos World Economic Forum uh, a few years ago. All the catastrophes that are coming our way, the likelihood that they will happen against the impact should they happen. And um, <clears throat> that's just what they are. But I marked up in yellow the ones that urbanism and urban uh, work and even design uh, can actually uh, help mitigate. So I, I'll be the last one to claim that urbanism uh, can solve or architecture can solve all your problems. Uh, it can't, but we can certainly play a critical role in a number of things. And of course, if it's about dealing with problems uh, or dealing with super big risks, uh, climate change being one of them, the answers, uh, you know, when you work on those, you also can project hope and a new opportunity and a perspective on a new and better life. And so we should not get stuck, and this is also again something design can do, not get stuck in uh, doomsday thinking, but seize incredible opportunities that present themselves uh, as a result of managing these, uh, these uh, terrifying risks. Now, these terrifying risks requ require big, impactful interventions. Eh? No small work uh, shall resolve these. And Cities and big actors sometimes try to do big projects. This does happen. Uh, but overall, the achievement rate for a big project is about 33%. So that means one out of every three projects, actually big projects, big systemic interventions in a city, actually succeeds. Two-thirds fail. Fail halfway through or never even get off the ground. And, you know, there is a, a lot of scholarship about this and why. You know, why. And then you can see that basically there are... In conceiving a big project, there are financial obstacles and risks, there are engineering and technical obstacles and risks, and those are difficult enough. Yet somehow, with the great minds that we have, and, uh, we are able to manage those. But often, things run awry, things go wrong uh, on these other obstacles, spatial obstacles, side effects we didn't think of, neighborhoods that are impacted, or you know, things that are just not, not, haven't been thought through, and not to forget social obstacles. You know, if you do a big intervention, it affects literally everybody, not just in the spatial tissue of a city, but also in that city's social tissue. The forms of, of relationships that we have with each other and the antagonisms and the ruptures that we also, uh, that divide us. Um, so these are the reasons big projects fail, we, yet we know we need them. So we need to develop a more integrated system uh, of managing um, financial, engineering, technical, 
spatial and social obstacles. And that's basically uh, one of the missions that I'm engaged in and my fundamental motivation personally, because Bas, you told me I should say something personal. <laughs> Uh, so here's uh, something. So why do you, we all ask ourselves perhaps, why do you wake up in the morning? You know, why do, how can I give meaning to my life? So I try to give meaning to my life with something that is still based on the PhD project that I was able to do here in Rotterdam, that's to say at the Berlage uh, with TU Delft a, a long time ago, uh, which was a reflection done by a number of authors uh, and designers, architects and philosophers that had to flee Europe uh, in the 30s because of the nascent barbarism and the, uh, 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 the totalitarian age in, on uh, our continent. Uh, and engage in a reflection and to say, what the hell did we do wrong in urbanism, in architecture, in planning? Why were we not able to seduce the masses into a model of an open society? And so this is a drawing basically that represents more or less uh, the totalitarian architecture diagram. So it's from the Soviet palace uh, by an architect working for Stalin, but the details don't, I mean, this even doesn't matter. You have this in many totalitarian regimes, a big ziggurat, a singular point of, uh, of synthesis for everything, a statue of the big boss somewhere on top. And so what they were after was an alternative model, like monuments for an open society. Could we advertise something for an open a society of, of pluralism where we disagree and we disagree continuously and basically accept that that's a good thing? We're not, accepted, we're not expected to always agree. And so they tried to basically formalize a monument that would somehow suggest, they literally took the pieces of this uh, uh, integrated composition, uh, chopped it to pieces and threw it on a platform uh, uh, as, as a series of uh, divergent positions that can never be fully reconciled but can coexist. Anyway, this is a sort of, an, uh, there is an aesthetics here. I'm not, I don't want to be stuck with this aesthetic of this diagram, but there's an idea underneath it of finding monumental celebrations of an open society while we are solving the big problems of our time. And I'm saying this because I'm convinced uh, that long before we all die from one or the other disaster, we'll, we'll be basically killing each other by chopping each other on the head uh, because we, we can no longer agree with each other about anything. So this is a, a big deal. We have to find ways to manage continuous disagreement while collaborating on huge projects. And in doing so, demonstrate excuse me, I want to go back one last, in doing so demonstrate that it is possible in a liberal democracy to do big things together. Because I've heard in the work in, in, in various places that were at several times, oh, if only we were in China, or if only we were in Russia, the big thing would have been built already. And sure enough, but you want to trade in your, your social contract for, for the other one? Uh, I'm less sure. So the model where we're, power is truly distributed and where basically any group can stop anything big, that's our model. So we have to find a way to demonstrate that in a society with distributed power, a liberal society, that we can actually get big things done. And that's today more necessary than ever. So that's why I wake up in the morning. <clears throat> so there's uh, three, uh, I, I will do the, the bigger part about Antwerp. Um, but there are a series of tools that we are developing with, with our company uh, to work on this bigger mission. Uh, and for me, the company, is, it's not an architect. I mean, we do architecture, we do the urban design, but fundamentally, there's a mission, and we select our work based on this mission. Uh, and we try to aim for work that can help accomplish this mission. Uh, so I have three inabilities that we are struggling with, an, a, an incre increasing inability to read. We are, many people in our uh, uh, bigger cities are unable to understand what their part of, which is the bigger community. I'm not talking about a neighborhood level that most people can figure out, but where does my neighborhood fit in the bigger picture? As our cities grow, a regional sense of consciousness um, is, is perhaps emerging, but finds a hard way to, to organize itself. So legibility, being able to read where you are in the larger picture is a huge issue. And screens and apps cannot solve all of that for you. The reference project I want to show to you here, even if very briefly, is a project we did for the Regional Plan Association. That is a, a beautiful association in, in the New York area built, uh, constituted of, of investors and developers, civic action committees, bottom-up action, uh, and, and governments, various governments are uh, joining as observers. And so every 25 years, they make a big plan for the New York area. And so we were very privileged because we were able to do the fourth plan 
so they exist for 100 years now. The fourth plan uh, for New York City and abroad beyond. But I'm showing you three slides because this project is a sort of a network organization of partially new mobility infrastructures, new technologies, but also conventional uh, tramways or, or met uh, subways. But it, we always operate on three scales, the scale of that entire system where you organize legibility, and then the scale of basically a neighborhood and up until the scale of a single node, a single point. And these three things, uh, uh, basically, every project has to have that scalar ladder where you go from the very local and in include that and make it give that a place in the very regional. Because also in New York, it's not easy to understand where you are and what you are a part of. We were working afterwards a bit with Google Sidewalk Labs on the more technology-driven parts of this. Transformations of existing, uh, you know, as it happens in Rotterdam, this also happens in New York, in most cities that we work in, parts that used to be almost suburban or older suburbs are in a fast pace becoming urban. Our expanding city, the growing city, is doing a turnover and making them parts of a, the city proper. And so that's also what this is about. The three scales, the region, let's say the conventional scale of urban design in, in Dutch, uh, Stadsontwerp, and the scale of actually architecture. <clears throat> So I think this is actually big in a society that is increasingly searching its own soul and is not able to get along and people are trying to figure out who they are and where they belong, legibility on the regional scale. A second big uh, agenda point is, uh, we call it here, productive neighborhoods, about our inability to relate to each other. Um, so this, is, this agenda is not a new agenda. This is why uh, cities have rules that if you build a fancy neighborhood, you need to include 20, 30% social housing, for instance. You want to have some kind of a mixity. But there's another kind of mixity that we've banned uh, and that we really ought to bring back. So the whole history of urban planning, at least in the US and the Anglo context, uh, is based on the separation of industry from housing. In fact, the very first reason urban planning in the US became a degree program was to, to develop technical thinking about the separation of production from residential industry and housing. This is a plan of, from Moscow from the 30s, but it was a dominant form of thinking in that, at that time. Uh, if I map today, this is a, a Boston. We did a, a research with the Center for Advanced Urbanism, which I ran for uh, uh, and helped create for four years, the first four years. We ran a research, where is production in the city of Boston today or in the Boston metro area? Well, it's very striking. In these ideal visions of the 20s and the 30s, you had basically a residential here, an industry somewhere there or here, very far apart. But in Boston today, they're completely mixed. There is a regime where uh, uh, production and city uh, or residential, what we conventionally understand as mixed-use residential retail offices, that they can mix. This is huge and it presents a big opportunity because the kind of companies have changed. Kind, the, the, kind, the way we do production has in fact changed. Tech innovation specifically, much less wasteful processes, much less uh, uh, polluting, polluting processes allow us to bring this back in. But this really needs to be matched because there are still, there's still truck traffic, there's still technology, there's still footprints, developer pressure because it's, it's hard to make money on a factory floor when you can also build nice apartments. So it's not that easy. But I think it's a huge program because in these new kind of companies, blue collar and white collar workers, PhDs and people fresh, uh, fresh immigrants, so to speak, work together and actually make the social mesh that our society needs. And if they can do it in the city, it gets even better. Um, we did one project, I'll be very brief about this, uh, near Manhattan. This is the Brooklyn Navy Yards. This is obviously Manhattan, uh, former yards of the, of the Navy. Uh, now is a development company owned by the city that has had its mandate to maximize uh, uh, employment in labor, so production. And so we've worked with that company and with the company WXY uh, to, build typo excuse me, to build typologies of uh, stacked, uh, basically, production skyscrapers. And I can't say that this literal type is being built, but a number of modifications of this typology are being adopted to actually do multi-story production up till six, seven, eight, in this, in this case, uh, 10 floors. <clears throat> this brings me to, the, to Brussels. Uh, I want to speak briefly about Brussels, which I know very well. I was born there, I grew up there. And um, you know that if you, most of you have been, it's a very chaotic city. It's a city you can love and hate at the same time. Uh, but we've had the commission to do a, a, a sort of a master plan for the whole zone of the canal, 
So that's a 20 kilometer stretch from the southern edge of Brussels all the way through the northern edge. So Brussels is surrounded by Flanders, but the canal and the railroads run from north to south, are the old industrial backbone of Belgium. If the, the production that is left in Brussels occurs here, so we worked on this plan basically to produce a sense of order and civic integrity uh, while knowing that the city was planning a development scheme to increase production. And I think this is the bold part, not, not as much our own plan, that in the parts that are here to really uh, safeguard this zone for mixed production with city. Production with city. And they said they were very ambitious. <clears throat> and so it's very hard to, to actually realize this. And I'll show you why. That we don't have... We don't, have, we don't have typologies for this. We have a nice separated building with a big parking lot for industry, and then a street, and then maybe something. But we don't have ways to really integrate seamlessly uh, these functions. Uh, so just a quick note on the framework plan, uh, big longitudinal infrastructures, those historical infrastructures, which can be partially reused. We can, we can make them more uh, based on a, on, a, on a culture of sharing, make it more multifunctional. But then, of course, uh, specifications per district so allow for really local, uh, local differentiation and enhance the identity of the districts. And then singularities or specific points that don't belong in any system but that deserve to be highlighted as unique destinations in this area. So this is a partial view. I mean, the 20 kilometers is too long because, I don't know if you know this, but I had to check at some point. Uh, if you stand somewhere, the horizon is 4.6 kilometers away. <laughs> So it's a nice number to remember, 4.6. Now, if you're very tall, it might be 4.7, if you're sure. Uh, but so, we, it, it's, it's, the area is too big, so it's, we can't fit it on one image. But I'm showing you this image, uh, we have a number of others, because it re relates to a project here uh, that we've uh, realized. <clears throat> so this is the old abattoir, the old slaughterhouses of Brussels. Um, this is what they looked like, and then we were asked to make a master plan for a production neighbor, a productive neighborhood. Uh, and because it's hard to deal with production, you need to be very flexible, you need to allow almost any kind of use, but make sure to guarantee a basic civic cultural quality so that it can become city, so it's not just a, a, an industrial terrain. So we produced the biggest plaza in, uh, in, in uh, well, uh, one of the biggest in Europe, 200 by 300 meters. Uh, and a series of almost identical blocks uh, that can house almost any kind of program, um, of which this one has been built, uh, the next one has been tendered, and uh, the other ones are going into uh, various stages of construction. But it's not easy. It's one of the more difficult parts of Brussels, so unemployment is, is the highest in this particular neighborhood. It's a his a historically a transitory neighborhood, many new arrivals that also leave after a few months or years. Uh, big slaughterhouses, huge markets, markets where fancy Eurocrats from the upper city meet uh, new immigrants and uh, shop and trade, which is a, a great mixer. And so our concept had to be finally a, a white square on white. This is a painting by Malevich uh, from 1918. It's a big plaza that is open to anything, surrounded by big buildings that are also open to anything. Um, <clears throat> so this is one building. Um, and so this is one way to deal with the mandate of introducing production in cities. Uh, it's one typological exercise, you could say. Uh, so we built really a sort of a, a mechano, a puzzle system of pieces in concrete that are tailored so you can drive a truck through, but you can also use it for uh, uh, offices, for, of course, industry, uh, for various forms of, uh, of housing even, or for markets. And so this is a picture in the built uh, situation. Uh, where you have one of the bigger uh, markets, this is with European subsidies, this project. Uh, and so the essence of this project is that the, the trading, which is what you do when you're in a commercial industrial environment, or, or these, these fruits are of course not, not all grown here, but the butcheries do cut the meat right there behind uh, in those uh, <coughs> uh, nooks. But the essence of the idea is that you know, a commercial economic transaction uh, is actually a huge moment of cultural victory. Because if I, if I buy a melon from you and I pay you two euros and you give me that melon, for a moment there we are two humans interacting. So we need to celebrate that, we need to ritualize that. That's a, it's a holy moment. And that's why these, these, uh, these porticos are overdimensioned, are abstracted almost with a platonic uh, system of forms. <clears throat> so that's one, and then on the roof there is a, a, a commercial urban farm of uh, 7,000 square meters, 
which is also under operation now. Uh, the project was selected in the uh, Biennale, uh, Biennale in Venice, uh, and so then, although we wanted a super simple generic structure without its own identity, really, it ended up becoming a bit iconic anyway with jewels and, uh, and installations. <laughs> But another typological exercise is making uh, making this not this. This was over two to three stories. What I just showed you is to do with over seven or eight stories and build it. New York is a bit, but New York that was a huge uh, type. Uh, this is a competition we won, and it's now under construction. A very simple uh, uh, floor plan that can be filled. The the, the section is a. Yeah, a reverse T that can be filled with any program, including industrial, at every floor. Uh, which has a, uh, requires a series of particular precautions uh, and then can be fitted into the city. A third typological experiment, this is a competition we ended second, and then I wrap up this, this particular theme, um, is if you really want to guarantee, and this is actually a rule system imposed by a, a framework from the city, from the region of Brussels, the entire ground floor at eight meters tall is to be reserved for industry. And then you need to add, I don't know, 10 stories of housing, uh, and more, uh, but this is a really tricky, a tricky one because you get trucks in here. You get uh, uh, there's a lot of I'm not going to say nasty stuff. It's proper to industry, but it's not so easy to mix it with housing. So the city ordained this uh, strict separation, which is then really begging the point: How do you make sure these two programs can coexist? We're close to the historical reason that they were separated, and in fact, a planned separation is now a sectional separation. And so um, <clears throat> we worked hard on this. And uh, basically, this is the ground floor plan of the industry. You can get trucks driving through. And ultimately, our conclusion in this typological experiment was that the space for interaction is in these lobbies, these colored items, where the entries for the, uh, the roof gardens and the, and the neighborhood are there. And you also interact with industry, but in a protected way. So from the outside, the lobby looks uh, deftig. <laughs> <laughs> but on the inside, this is happening. And then there's a lobby space between this, uh, between this pie, which is there, and this pie, it's actually where it happens. <laughs> so it's a very condensed space, but that's where, the, I would say, the essence of the urban dimension and of the ambition level of the project is in these lobbies. Okay. <clears throat> a third, uh, a third uh, big agenda point is work collectively, work together with each other. And so when we make a plan, and certainly civil engineers and architects and also many uh, technocrats tend to think of a plan as a blueprint. It's something technical you make and you need the dimensions need to work. You know what I mean. But in fact, for a big urban project or a big systemic intervention, the plan is your social contract. So when we negotiated constitutions a long time ago with the separation of powers and the basic uh, rules of how we can be taxed, and how we give our money to the government and what the government gives back to us. These are all examples of social contracts, agreements we make with each other about how to get things done because we know we need to organize ourselves. That's what a plan is. A big plan, a big blueprint is, first of all, a social contract. And we make a big mistake by reading it as a technical blueprint. Of course, it needs to be technically okay. It needs to be financially feasible, that, that'd be clear. But that's not the dimension that's going to get you the project. It's a social contract. So <clears throat> this is then the case study of Antwerp. Um, Antwerp has a long history. In 1996, uh, this is 24 years ago, the Flemish government decided it was time to close the ring. So this part of the ring exists, uh, and this part uh, didn't and doesn't. Um, <clears throat> so this was a big idea. Uh, at first, everybody loved it, and then the doubt, doubts started to seep in. Of course, this massive project, you don't do it in a day. So it took also a lot of effort to get this organized. Uh, and by the time there was an organization and a big plan and a, a budgeting, and the financial and the technical constraints had been uh, arranged or taken care of, there were action committees. And one action committee said, well, you know, we have another priority. Maybe we should cap, uh, put a roof over the ring, and put a big park here in this particular area. So different location, completely different idea. So these two things were stuck with each other for a very long time. And in fact, things got worse and worse. Um, and so by in 19, uh, 2016, <laughs> excuse me, in 2016, we were appointed to try to help break through an impasse, a sort of a, a, an impossible situation that we had arrived at. And one of the first things we had to do 
uh, was actually establish joint facts. So people are so factionalized in different groups, in different uh, communities. They spoke with each other, but, but not people from the other community. So people were, you know what I'm talking about, they had their own facts. Uh, and, and it's very hard to establish these facts because most facts are in, or most contested facts are interdisciplinary. So they're not a simple truth one engineer can deliver or one scientist can deliver, but it's between knowledge domains. It's between acoustics and pollution and design and ecology and mobility and tunnel safety. It's somewhere in between. And these are the truths that are needed, that these are the facts that society needs, but nobody can deliver them from their own knowledge domain. So to give you an example, so we had a situation where um, you know, there was a discussion about trajectories, alternative trajectories. Why should it be closed here or more northern? More northern? We had a discussion, a huge public discussions. It was a plebiscite, a, a, a referendum. Uh, so, and then there was a whole set of uh, discussions about uh, ecology, landscape, capping, tunnel safety, etc. So it, I added up the various um, uh, uh, diplomas that you need to manage these. It's more than 20 because this alone is about uh, 15 diplomas and I'm missing a few. So it's, it's impossible to solve this by yourself. This, these big city, these big project problems are bigger than any of our brains can actually grasp. And I don't think AI will actually uh, solve it for us either in the next five years. So this is a huge exercise of finding knowledge that we can agree on, uh, is find facts we can agree on as being true by experts from all these fields that actually need to work together. So that was a big part of our work. So we have all these experts, uh, safety, innovation, mobility, city, uh, urban development, health, ecology, uh, and you probably know this, but in certain, well, in most fields, experts have their own bias. So when you talk about mobility, there are progressive mobility experts and more conservative mobility experts. And they have complete, so it starts actually with that. Experts bring their bias, you need to make sure the different biases are correctly represented. So now we go from 20 to 40. <laughs> and then you have to find common facts and agree. So we spent a lot of time on that and, you know, about 200 working sessions a year, drawing, calculating, uh, figuring out truth versus fiction. So in a sense, it's collective education. It's a sort of a, a bottom-up university. You try to find the best minds, engage citizens in that, and then actually build facts together and learn together and discover together. So this is an example of one session. We had about 150 people participating in, in alternating sessions, mobility, ecology, uh, air and uh, noise, uh, uh, civic act, so, so, you know, civic participation, uh, action committees, participation, civil technical issues, and so forth. You can keep going with this. So it's just, a, just the mathematics of getting these exchanges organized and making sure that they're not just a talk shop, but you actually get to the bottom of something, then people got homework. So you don't meet just to talk, people bring new material. So we had a lot of people working. I must say that this was also, Arab Engineering was a, a subcontractor in this project for us and has played a big role in this. But of course, for the citizens, it's always about this. I mean, the health statistics in Antwerp are not great. And now with the project as it has been approved, uh, uh, this is, uh, these are air quality measurements. Uh, we're projected to go towards something much better. So metrics, calculations, as much as drawings. Uh, I mentioned the public dimension of all this. So we, we had to go to uh, the Flemish equivalent of the, the Tweede Kamer, so the Flemish parliament. Uh, publish books, uh, ambition statements, uh, research, publish it, get it approved. And I, I must say I'm extremely proud that the Flemish parliament endorsed a, a majority and opposition together uh, the vision statement for the ring that is shown here. But of course, that's not the public, that's the representatives of the public. <laughs> um, so we also need the public itself. This is what the public looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, this is not just an exhibition. I want to point this out to you. In this particular, you see these people with the, with the light green shirts. So we had, we had many exhibitions, but they were interactive. So of course we had work sessions. We showed work. We had these 40 people with the green shirts that are there always to explain to you what is being shown because plans or drawings are often hard to understand. So there was a, a layer of interpreters, translators available. So then people understood it and then they could give feedback, which we could then use in the next round of design. 
what this means in this kind of big collective public mission is that you, you can forget about control. And this is extremely scary for a number of, of actors. Um, but you can steer, you can curate, you can push, you can, and, and if everybody's part of the process, you can also give some faith or trust into that process. So you know if things are completely going against your, uh, let's say, uh, interests, you can, you can push back. <clears throat> So where are we now with this project? Um, and this is also part of the curatorial role, uh, rather than the control. We, we have to divide this. It's, the ring is huge. We're talking about more than 25 kilometers. This part is under construction and should be finished. Uh, well, you see that here. This is the famous Osterville connection. This was the object of all that contestation. Uh, there, the, the environmental permit has been uh, submitted. Uh, and the uh, uh, building permit will be submitted in about a month. And this project, we completely redesigned it with the stakeholders, with the execution agencies, and with various levels of government. Uh, this one is in a study phase without budget. This one is in a sort of an earlier phase, but it has been budgeted. So pretty soon, I'm, I'm guessing we will be construction not just on the left bank of Antwerp, but on most of the right bank. Uh, and when that's done, uh, this part, which will not have been done, might be tackled. So if you go to France on vacation, good luck. <laughs> but so one of the things that are very important to manage here are, uh, are the fact that things are changing. This is a, the construction of one leg is 10 years, 10 years. This is not like building a house. So when you build for 10 years, you need to be able to upgrade and change and improve your project as you go, because of course, knowledge changes. We, learn, we keep learning new things and we must be able to integrate those in the design. So that means that we have a dynamic master plan, which I'm showing you the, the last version of here, uh, and that every year this master plan gets updated uh, with new insights and where possible processes of construction are still being impacted. Uh, the master plan has four layers, one called breathing space, which has all the ecological dimension. You see here three big parks, uh, the northern park, the southern park, and the western park, and also big capping projects. And I must say that this one is under construction, and this one, hopefully, a very big ambitious park that will connect the eastern and the northern park systems of Antwerp will go under construction soon. Why is this a, a particular source of joy that this northern edge of Antwerp, I'm going back to one slide for a second here, this northern edge is the part of the city that has historically gotten all the difficult programs, slaughterhouses, docks, uh, water purification plants, highways, railroad embankments, all the stuff that the nice bourgeois city, which is more here, didn't want, it was pushed to the north, including that piece of highway that caused so much contestation, um, and so these neighborhoods have had a, a rough time. So now we can offer them uh, the biggest park uh, of Belgium <coughs> uh, in the middle uh, of what used to be a seizure, uh, an interruption, a rupture. Of course, a lot of work on mobility. One of the ambitions that have been agreed on is a modal shift for 50%, which is uh, in the Flemish context quite radical. Uh, so a lot of investment is not just in this highway, but in parallel systems, in multimodal nodes, uh, in uh, working mobility as a system, uh, as a service. There is a real estate component, but I must say that we've tried to, uh, while being prescriptive in some ways, also try to keep a distance from it, um, uh, just because these are separate processes, but make sure that the designs are aligned. But that's a, it's a huge chance to, to grow the city expand the city and of course it's and it's extremely important it's a cultural space you know if you think about the, the the great market hall in antwerp or in brussels or these beautiful medieval cities that we have here in the low countries they're like a 14th or a 15th century summary of everything in society logistics trade industry but it was also a cultural space these are the most beautiful buildings and all the trade was happening right there so this space Today, the highway is a space of logistics. I mean, you know it, you've driven there. It's not a particularly attractive place. And also the city turns its back to the ring road for obvious reasons. It's smelly and it's loud. Uh, but it can become a space of culture and it can become the new uh, market, the new central plaza for an expanded region. Uh, just like in Rotterdam, just like in Amsterdam, just like in many other places, Antwerp is growing fast. And the city, which used to be historically defined as within these walls, uh, is at least at least uh, uh, three times the size now, 
and seeing itself as fundamentally urban. So this is in the middle. And so then we can go to images like this. And that's, uh, so this is by the way, at Sportpalais, which is right here. So it's the viaduct that you're driving through. Uh, if you go uh, uh, past Antwerp, is, is right here, and that will go away. <coughs> What's very important is insight in distributed power situation. What I mean by that is that, uh, uh, so we cannot, there is no powerful government, and certainly not in Belgium, but in most places in the West, the government is not fundamentally very powerful. We have distributed power. Uh, and everything can be contested. So we need to give players insight in how power is distributed and make them realize that you can have a decision here at a certain moment and that may lead you to act like that and push against, eh, push this button. But you don't know in the complexity of the power structure what pushing a button here means as an outcome back there. And so that's why we've used game theory, which is a, a economics and mathematics thing to actually set up all the decision points for this process and map all the possible outcome outcomes of every possible decision in order to make people understand that most outcomes are pretty shitty. So we, you know, this, is just, this is just 20, but we had it for 4,000 outcomes and all of them were red, which is not, was not desired by any of the players. And there's a few greens and they're here on top. A few, uh, four greens out of 1,996 reds or greys. So it's helpful. It's not easy to understand how power works and people are by nature suspicious. They think somewhere there's the big man and he's going to decide. There is no big man and nobody can decide. And that's what you can help explain. They're part of the decision-making process, whether they want it or not. So building trust relationship is huge. In, in a city like Antwerp has had many historical ruptures that sometimes go back to the Second World War or before. Uh, but this is a, a signing ceremony of a, of a covenant. It's almost a biblical term, a covenant for the future of Antwerp. We have the president of Flanders, the mayor of the city of Antwerp, uh, and uh, the civic action committees, a more rather conservative government. Action committees rather progressive, but they did sign the covenant. It's, it's existing for almost um, three years now, and it's still there, and it's not been ruptured. We had the night before, we had the rings made in the Orthodox district in Antwerp, beautiful silver rings with an engraving, author of the covenant for the future of Antwerp. <laughs> and we have the president of the country and the leader of the, mo a leader of the most important action committee, they were the same ring. So this marriage is being consumed right now. <laughs> A very, a very important bijvangst or side effect has been that uh, to restructure the way we work together. So <clears throat> this is a, a, so, a diagram so simple it's almost stupid, but you see three colors of heads, uh, and let's say uh, each color signifies a different kind of actor. We have uh, people from public administration, civil servants from the city, from the from the from the Reich, from the nation, uh, or from the province. Let's say that's the color color yellow. And then you have experts, designers, engineers, uh, yours truly, I'm, I, I sit in that category, say blue. And then we have citizens themselves. So we really invite citizens to be part of these processes. Of course, you need to find people that are willing to spend the time and, if, and that have the capability to want to engage, but citizens are fundamentally now part of this process. Uh, as also a way to show there is no hidden agenda, there is no backroom dealing, it's all happening here, you're seeing the, uh, the sketches as much as the outcomes, you're part of the big discussions. So it's a measure of extreme transparency, which I'm personally very proud of, and I think it works. We're all scared of this, but it kind of works. And you lose time sometimes because you need to re-explain and re-explain, but on the, on the other side, you do go through a door together. I think you got, you, maybe you call that poldern. Huh? <laughs> But so, I mean, that, that level of engagement, we had a, a, an office called Common Ground, which was another subcontractor that just was really an expert in, in techniques of participation. We ended up having more than five, well, 4,000 people, regular people engaging in this process. This is almost a, a statistically significant sample of the population. So all these people we spoke to on a one-on-one -on -one basis and got inputs from. Uh, we had offices in neighborhoods, uh, designers and, and citizens engaging with each other, big campaigns, Ringbauers, uh, uh, to get this off the ground, a collective project. But I can't repeat enough, uh, and maybe I'm biased because I am a designer, so I am definitely biased, but design is the key. 
Space is a generous medium and design is a form of diplomacy and it can solve things that you can never solve in pure discussion, in discursive discussion. Very simple example, you may wish to install, we may, we may share a house, you may want a corridor, I may want a library. We can never finish this discussion if we send emails to each other or if we fight and we discuss face to face and use words. If we use an Excel table, it gets worse because one is more expensive than the other and we will, still, we will even less agree. But if we find somebody that can draw for us a space that you can walk through, that is wide enough to also have some books, we can have something that's and a library and a corridor at the same time, except we don't have the word for that. But we can design it. So that's what I mean, it's a generous medium. You can continuously invent, continuously invent new categories of, of coexistence that don't have names yet. So once we had the big deal, once we had the covenant, the agreement, all the court cases by the action committees were withdrawn. The government said we will uh, invest much more in quality of life in Antwerp, build these big parks. So then we could get to work with the actual design with the neighborhoods. We divided the ring in six zones. Um, <clears throat> and I will just show you a few images uh, of the northern ring by team Bür and Lutz, a uh, Flemish and a German uh, uh, office. Uh, uh, our own team had a very small piece. Uh, as a pilot project, we started on that project earlier to just test technical uh, constraints and difficulties. But by the way, this is a sport palace. This is the ring around Antwerp. So if you want to negotiate a highway through a neighborhood, that's what that highway looks like. Yeah, there is no highway. I mean, it's there. It's here. But this is one of, also one of the most beautiful parks in the, in the area. And that's what it looks like on the ground. There is at Sport Palace, you are now driving today here on the viaduct. And we had a team of Paola Vigano based in uh, uh, Venice and Brussels, uh, Milan and Brussels, team of Agence Terre from Paris and uh, Arcadis, <coughs> and a uh, team of uh, Bureau Omgeving and the Urbanisten from this uh, beautiful city. Again, this is a highway. It's also a big regional landscape park on the west side of Antwerp. So uh, a few more points on this. So what we had, what we did with these, so we had these teams in the six zones and they worked and worked on, on amazing design projects, but we asked them, please focus on concrete buildable pieces, no utopias, something we can do. So they came up with 27 together, they came up with 27 puzzle pieces amounting 3 billion euro. And so the covenant had assigned 1.25 billion euro, so this was clearly too much. <laughs> But at the same time, it was a deliberate strategy to be able to select the best projects. So then we could internally compare them. So this is a master plan with all the projects uh, in the same drawing style and glued to each other. All the projects marked with costs uh, and, and categorization. And then we did a series of exercises. We did a quantitative analysis of the health performance, of ecological benefits. We had a, an arch a design jury, uh, architecture and urbanism jury. We, of course, had the MKBA, a cost-benefit analysis, and then with all these engagements with the public to measure which puzzle pieces they felt were going to benefit them more or less. Uh, and with these four metrics, uh, we finally, uh, and these were done in parallel, but I must say, for these, we took it, we left the whole design and, and, com and expert community that we had behind and contacted a whole other group of people so that we could be really firewalled and the evaluation would not be steered by uh, any particular actor. <coughs> so of this, these are all the 27, uh, previous shot, yeah? these are all the 27, and these are the selected projects for 1.25. So and I must say one of the things that finally that I think is really important and that I learned from the anthropology is you cannot do this just with risk management language. If you want people to jump over a historical reservation or rupture or something that they might have that is really difficult for them, you must write a big narrative together, a big story. Cities are made of stories. Places have stories and we transmit the stories generation through generation and add new chapters in the story of a place. And that's, if you do a big intervention, you're writing a story and you have to set the story before you start building. And one of the nice stories that was brought both by the, the mayor of Antwerp and the leader of the biggest action committee was, so this is project called Osterville. Osterville is the name of a small fortification uh, that in the 16th century was attacked 
And when the Spanish came, and uh, this was the beginning of the fall of Antwerp, of the loss of Antwerp to the, uh, to the Spanish and to the Inquisition. Uh, so they both said, well, we've lost that battle. The battle of 500 years ago we lost, but this battle we've won. <laughs> For the Dutch, uh, vive les gueux, long live the, uh, uh, the geuzen. <laughs> and so we won this battle. At, this was, of course, a battle of society with itself. This is a battle of Flanders with itself, with its own internal divisions, with its own disagreements. And can we, can we actually, there were no Spanish invaders here. This was uh, fighting your own ghosts as a society. And I do think uh, that, uh, that they won this one. And finally, one last thing, there's now a plan for a bridge over the Schelde, a pedestrian bridge, a pedestrian and biking bridge. Uh, while it is not sure that it will, we're still dealing with nautical discussions on this, but the fact that the bridge has in principle been approved is another big victory. Antwerp has had designs for bridges for 200 years, but the only bridge that's ever been built was built by the Spanish during the invasion <laughs> 500 years ago. <laughs> so finally, uh, a, a, you know, a quick reflection on Rotterdam. I've had the great pleasure of being led around by, by Bas and, the, and Barbara and the team of AIR. Uh, I've studied here a long time ago. I love this city. It's changed incredibly over the last 20 years, and this city should be giving lessons to others. Uh, but it really, it's nice of you that you also want to still get lessons by others. Uh, so I've tried to... Uh, <coughs> um, you have a very big vision. You have a very big ambition here. This is a, a, the, the development that you foresee happening, and just as I understand it, this is the city, as you know it, the sprung over the side has succeeded, and is kind of here now at Katendrecht. This is what you have, a city, but look where you're going. And so one of the things that I, that I, that I would plead for is to focus enough on big continuities and also give room to big anomalies. <laughs> and that sounds contradictory, but I'm going to focus on the continuities first. Um, the continuities that you have on this scale are basically, except for the river, are the railroad and the highway and some big, big, let's say, infrastructures that belong to the nation, to the Reich. And I'm wondering, and, and look, that means this is actually a big continuity. Uh, these things are, are, uh, are not, and what you get is just an incredible uh, sequence of ruptures. Uh, there are no big continuities today in your city. Maybe it's not necessary, but if you're going to expand the way you plan to, it might become necessary. You have huge ruptures. There are continuities in one sense, <laughs> but there are ruptures in the other. And that's where the problem, I think, lies. If you're going to work on these big axes, these big, big, long, you have the chance to do a big collective project in this city and basically scope the city to a next level scale. And it means, I think, it's a, a reconfiguration of the infrastructure. It's rethinking the infrastructure. And, you know, a lot of this is basically dealing with unpleasant infrastructures, uh, whether it's uh, highways or, or big railroad bundles. And the solutions that you're, that you're comfortable with are maybe also not always the right solutions. You know, just separating it is a, is a possibility, but it's also... Um, I mean, I was very struck by this beautiful campus. 20, 25 years ago, if you went to the Erasmus campus, you would think it was a completely suburban location, and now you almost feel like it's almost part of the city. So it's really re the city is really expanding also in the way you, you sense it. Um, but it's on a model that is still a very strong a campus model and a separation of, uh, of flows. These are your big infrastructures. <clears throat> and so I want to show you this drawing. This is another city. The name doesn't matter. Uh, but there is a highway here. There's a highway there. And there's a highway around the city. This is the ring highway of that city. And so we did a proposal there uh, for that city to actually install a secondary big continuity, this red. And I don't know how to call it. It's a rode loper. Um, I'm just going to show something, this idea a little bit more close up. Something that really connects all the disparate pieces and fragments and constitutes a kind of glue, but has a coherence in itself, offers ecological mobility um, for, for public transportation as well as for bikes and, and electrified uh, light systems, um, but really constitutes a logic that can operate and can be expanded. And it doesn't have to be attached to the highway. In fact, preferably it doesn't. 
but it mitigates and it installs a really long continuity on the scale of that region. So that brings me back to the point of the first point, legibility on a regional scale. This is feasible. This is actually not, ex not as expensive as building a railroad bundle or a highway. <clears throat> and this is a, these things are, are like uh, big operations that uh, can be done in piecemeal, but they c literally connect the city and connect the heart of the city, which is doing great with all the rest parts of which, as you know, are struggling. And you're now going to invest there, but I don't think that's, I mean, the connection and the way in which you install a great link uh, that is uh, continuous is, is... And so there is plenty of evidence for this. So in uh, Boston, this has the Massachusetts Avenue. This is uh, 35 miles long. It doesn't even go through the center, uh, but really connects uh, at many, and it is, it's a boulevard. It has, you, you cannot drive more than 40, 45 kilometers per hour. There's room for many other modes. Wiltshire Boulevard in Los Angeles, Wolleboulin in Brussels are similar examples. I must say the Wolleboulin, I find an example of how the location is right, but the section is completely uh, not helping. Um, but so that, that's the long, the, the, that, that's about the long, but I'm, I want to show you this drawing and I'm almost uh, uh, wrapping up here. I want to show you this drawing as well because this is the project for the ring. Now the ring is, as you know, now in a tunnel here. Again, a spot bias. It's in a tunnel. But the big project of the cap is not making a nice green fixture. I mean, that's part of it. Big ecological continuity, north to south. But here's the project in these transversal uh, figures, these uh, stitches. They're not on a huge scale, but they're incredibly important because everything that was ruptured and was broken can not, not, that, not to fix everything, but things can be reconnected. So the fix is actually in the transversal. And, uh, and actually, there's the, that's where the project is. Because otherwise, how, how to get to the park, how to do anything. Um, funny enough, the ring project is about uh, like a Visgraat, the uh, the 90 degrees uh, turn from the ring project. Finally, this section I think is really important uh, because it shows you a, a highway or a big infrastructure such as some of the ones that you have here. Uh, just by, you've built your own country here, right? I mean, this is one of the amazing achievements. Now, you can, it's not that hard to reshape it. That means you can actually change it and make nice hills. I must say, this is a drawing by Omgeving and Urbanisten. So they deserve the full credit for this in the Antrop condition. But this is a, a ring, a part of the ring that is not yet capped, but can be in the future. So in parts where you want to really wrap, <coughs> wrap these infrastructures, you can. You can have a long-term plan and you don't have to do it right away, but you can build up to it. And already with this, you have 10 to 15 decibel. That's huge. That's more than half reduction in noise. And you have a beautiful park and you prep for the cap. So I was just doing a, a very simple, dumb mapping myself on the, where are these kind of a red, uh, uh, red carpets today in Rotterdam. And you definitely find them from Central Station to, to Nieuwzuid, uh, up to Katendrecht. There are beautiful figures. Uh, but then look where all, the, where all the new opportunity lies. So then I'm wondering if it could be possible to really think of big red carpets that are soft and generous and can take a turn if necessary, but they really do connect. They're in the vicinity of these big hard infrastructures, but they're not right at the same location. But they really provide a figure for the larger Rotterdam that is coming into being. And maybe this is all in the works. I don't, I'm, I'm not enough informed, so I may give you very, very silly ideas. <laughs> um, but then really the figure of a new expanded Rotterdam starts to get a, a name and starts to get an identity, and the stitches uh, uh, can find a place. And with a project like this, the advantage if you operate on a scale like this is you can tackle, because you intervene systemically. And we know it's possible because it's happening in other cities. You can do this, stitch your social fabrics together, solve a bunch of ecological issues, solve a bunch of mobility issues, and, uh, and uh, attract all the new growth you need around those um, <coughs> red carpets. Thank you very much. <laughs>